Good day. It's good to be here with you uh, today. Um, moving well into January. Boy, it doesn't seem like it takes long before we move week after week into a new year. Uh, if you were here with us last week, or if you've heard, uh, heard the message that, that uh, was put out last week, we began a new sermon series in the book of Galatians. We're calling it For Freedom. Um, you can always check to see uh, online uh, if you've missed that one. There's the video there. It should be for you on Red Water Alliance Church or the Facebook page. Today we want to continue along in that sermon series as we look at uh, Paul's letter in, uh, a little more in depth today. So I'm so glad you're here. I hope you've had a, a, a great day. God's blessings on you as you uh, are here with us now. Thank you for inviting me in your homes the speaker was well respected. He often speak to churches and other venues. And other venues, uh, his popularity in evangelical circles resulted in invitations to conferences across the country. Invited to speak on radio and TV, he often spoke in defense of his doctrines at universities and public debates. His social media presence was large. He was charming, kind, and respectful of others. He was a good husband and a loving father. He was a kind of neighbor everybody appreciated. A generous person. Always willing to give a helping hand or give of what he had. He was a gifted speaker. And when he spoke, he appealed to the Bible. And like a gifted artist painting a scene across a blank canvas, his messages were crafted with eloquence and reason. His tone was respectful and affirming. He hit all the right notes. And his audiences, his audiences, pardon me, for the most part welcomed his message with smiles, nodding their heads in agreement. Very few noticed that the beautifully crafted landscape painted with eloquent, inspiring words, few noticed his fangs. The Apostle Paul said to the Galatians, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. And we'll pick up the, uh, the text in verse 10 and read through to the end of the chapter. Chapter 1, verse 10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to, ple to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers that the gospel that was preached to, by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I, did not, I do not lie. Verse 21. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, Cilicia pardon me, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness and kindness in our lives. And as I uh, consider what Paul is saying here in the text, I thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives, for the cross, and for what Christ has done on the cross for each and every one of us. We thank you for those things, Lord, and ask by your Holy Spirit that you would teach us and guide us into all truth. Teach us and guide us 
so that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, in our introductory text, chapter 1, verse 1 to 9, Paul stated that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. So Paul, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, was speaking on behalf of Jesus. Not for men, as Paul said in verse 1, not for men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he proclaimed the risen Christ. Where we read in verse 1, God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul proclaimed, my friends, the true gospel. For Jesus Christ, Paul would go on to say, gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. That's verse 4. And last week, we also briefly, ever so briefly, explored Paul's conversion and calling to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, as described for us in chapters, in, pardon me, in Acts chapters 13 and 14. And all this is a result of Paul's encounter with Jesus Christ on his way to persecute the church in Damascus. And we see that in, ver- in chapter 8 and 9 of Acts. So in summary, Paul provided a basis for his letter to the churches in Galatia. This included Paul's true test of apostleship, his obedience to the true gospel. And Paul's apostolic authority, while not random, is valid only according to what he said in verse 8, that he was faithful to the true gospel that he preached. So it's from this framework that, that it is no wonder that Paul was taken aback concerning the churches he had planted in Galatia. For the context of the Galatians makes it quite clear False teachers were making their rounds in the Galatian churches, teaching another gospel, which according to Paul didn't even exist. For Paul said it in verse 7, not that there is another one. Another what? There is no other gospel, in other words. You know, it's often difficult to translate, and I'm not a translator, I'm not a, a trained translator of the Greek However, it's not difficult, it's difficult to translate how upset Paul was with the false teachers. But we can get a sense of what he thought should happen to anyone who was teaching a gospel that was different than the one he taught. For he tells us in verse 9, let him be accursed. In our current jargon, Paul was saying, and this is going to be rough, but he was saying basically false teachers Go to hell. So today we want to continue where we left off last week and pick up Paul's comments in verse 10. Please read the verse 10 with me. For I am now seeking, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I'm still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So what is Paul meaning here? Well, first things first, let's not pull this text, this verse, out of its context. False teachers were denying the true gospel in the Galatian churches. They were adding to it circumcision, Jewish customs and rituals. And one can reason that for the false teachers to make any headway into changing the minds of the Galatian believers, at the very least, they would need to bring into question their former teacher, the Apostle Paul. So we go to the grammar of the original language, the use of, uh, of adverbs, strong adverbs, the context. In the New Testament as a whole, it points to the attempt by false teachers to discredit Paul and his gospel in some way. So based on this, Paul begins here, verse 10, through to chapter 2, verse 14, to present his attestation. In other words, his testimony. Some would say that this was his defense against the accusations of false teachers to the validity of Paul's gospel, and that would be true too. And of course, this is not the first time that Paul would be challenged. We see in another context, which was different, and the challenges that were different, we see Paul going to great lengths in his first letter to the church, to the Corinthians, to defend his apostleship and his gospel. So moving on here to verse 11 and 12, 
Paul presents as the IVP commentary puts it, his thesis. And this is important for us to grasp, to understand. Paul has already said that he was not interested in seeking the approval of any person. If this were the case, Paul stated emphatically here in verse 10, I would not be a servant of Christ. This word servant, translated from the Greek word doulos, which actually can be translated slave as well. And possibly this was the, a part of the false teacher's argument against Paul. You see, Paul's gospel was a result of his desire to please the Gentile believers. Paul's attempt to win them over was done by dumbing down the gospel. And so by using a strawman argument, that would be one way on the part of these false teachers to undermine Paul. By presenting the possibility, the plausibility that Paul had other motives than the true gospel would be key in casting doubt into the minds of the Galatian believers. But here in verse 11 and 12, it, it's almost like Paul read the minds of these false teachers and slams the door hard on their straw man. For he says here in verse 11, the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel. In other words, Paul's gospel was not according to man. We go to Paul's Roman letter for more commentary. There we see that he was in anguish, he said. He said uh, in verse 9, verse 2, uh, chapter 9, pardon me, verse 2, I have great sorrow and, angu uh, uh, and unceasing anguish in my heart. Why was this unceasing anguish in his heart? For the Jews who had yet to believe his gospel. And he prefaced his heartfelt statement with this, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. So one must ask this. If Paul was trying to dumb down the gospel for the Gentile believers, why, when speaking of his own kinsmen, the Jews, would he say with a heaviness of heart, in verse 3 of chapter 9, Romans, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. See, Paul didn't dumb down the gospel for his own people. Matter of fact, here he volunteered to take upon himself eternal damnation if only the Jews would accept what he calls the truth in Christ. Yes, someone preached the gospel to Paul. And no, Paul did not receive it from any man, nor was Paul taught it, as he says here in verse 12. So how did Paul receive the gospel? He tells us in verse 12, I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So from verse 13 through to 24, we have Paul's testimony of his salvation. And the details he provides concerning the revelation of Jesus Christ in his life were confirmed and accepted by the other apostles as well. And Luke, Doc Luke, an eyewitness of Paul's apostolic ministry, recorded Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. And not only his conversion, but Paul's transformation from a persecutor of the church in Acts 8 to a humble servant of Jesus Christ who brought, brought the gospel far beyond Jerusalem as far as the European continent. Yet, friends, false teachers, most likely calling themselves Jewish Christians, were attempting to subvert Paul's gospel of grace and teach a works gospel grounded in their former way of life, that is, Judaism. And this begs the question that I have for you. When you think of false teachers in the church today, what kind of picture do you form in your mind of that false teacher? Jesus spoke about false teachers and false prophets. In Matthew chapter 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Verse 15, Jesus said this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We go to chapter 20 of the book of Acts, and there we find Paul on his way to Jerusalem where he would be arrested and tried. 
And along the way, he stopped by uh, nearby the Ephesian church. And there he sent messengers to Ephesus to ask the elders of the church to come to him so he could tell them of his plans of going to Jerusalem. See, Paul was very aware that this would be the last time he would ever see them, and it was. You can read all this for yourself in Acts chapter 20. But this is what Paul said about false teachers to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 31. Paul said, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. From among your own selves will arise men speaking twist, twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. So let me ask you again. What kind of picture do you have in your mind of a false teacher? And whatever picture that you have in your mind, I don't think the Apostle Paul could possibly be found there. One, Paul received the gospel by revelation from Jesus, which was confirmed biblically, scripturally, and historically in his time and in our time. Two, Paul's gospel is clearly understood. It's not complicated. The false teachers were trying to make it complicated. Three, Paul's gospel was God-made, not man-made. For Paul's gospel did not differ from the gospel of the other apostles in its very basic context, content. Five, contrary to the false works-based gospel, Paul's gospel defines that one is justified by, justified by faith in Christ alone, not by the Mosaic law, not by anything else, nothing else, Jesus only, faith in Jesus only. And this helps us understand the impact that Jesus Christ had on Paul. It wasn't what we see in our times today. People just adding Jesus to their lives to make it better. The gospel, Jesus Christ, changed Paul dramatically. Dramatically. From verse 13 to 16a, that's the first bit of verse 16, we have a before and an after snapshot of Paul's life. We have before his encounter with Jesus and then after his encounter. And before, Paul describes, him in verse, describes himself in verse 14 as someone who is extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. So extremely zealous was Paul that he was willing to persecute the church of God violently, verse 13. And in his own words, he said, he tried to destroy it, verse 13. But after, everything changed. Here in verse 15 to 16a, Paul points out that it was God who set Paul apart. But when he who set me apart before I was born, verse 15. What was Paul doing here? Paul was saying that his prophetic role as an apostle from God had been set before even his birth. Yes, once he was a persecutor of the church. Doesn't excuse that. Yet God was still sovereign in his choosing of Paul. This was something Paul would be uh, addressing here. He looked back to the same things that happened to, to the other prophets as it happened to him. For example, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. We read, Now the word of the Lord came to me, that's Jeremiah, saying this, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was appointed a prophet to the nations before he was even formed in the womb. Friends, God chose Paul before the foundation of the world by his grace to reveal his son, Jesus Christ. To Paul, by special revelation, so what? So that he might preach him among the Gentiles, verse 16a. From, from verse 16b right through the 24, Paul continues to build his case that the gospel he preached was from Christ only. We see here that after his conversion, he spent three years in Arabia, and only then did he go to Jerusalem for 15 days. That's two weeks plus a day. 
And he spent time there with the Apostle Peter and also some time with the Lord's brother, James. So 15 days in Jerusalem, and then Paul went to Syria and Cilicia, and Cilicia where he, we learned that he didn't return to Jerusalem for another 14 years, chapter 2, verse 1. So a total of 17 years, minus 15 days after his conversion and calling from Jesus, Paul spent, spent elsewhere, not in Judea. So what was Paul up to for 16 years and 350 days? Well, in Paul's own words, he was unknown to the churches of Judea, verse 22. So what was he up to? Well, Paul lets the churches of Judea answer our question. Verse 23, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Verse 23. See, Paul wasn't on a vacation. He didn't have another career. Well, he was a tent maker. But he wasn't on vacation. He wasn't preaching another gospel. He was preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Verse 23. And the faithful in Judea glorified God because of Paul. Friends, Paul preached a gospel of grace upon grace. The false teachers in the Galatian te churches preached another gospel, a go gospel of work salvation. It's Jesus plus, 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 plus. And false teachers and prophets would continue throughout Paul's ministry. And Paul continually would need to address the dangers of another gospel my friends, nothing has changed since Paul's day. So here we are in the 21st century evangelical context, faced with the reality that Paul faced in his time. The reality that Satan, as Greg Morris put it so well in one of his articles, quote, dresses us, dresses up, dresses up as what he isn't. He disguises himself, putting dark for light, wickedness for righteousness, down for up, hell for heaven. He lies down in bed, appearing innocent, while trying to hide his fangs. And friends, as Satan is, so are his followers. Paul describes these for us in his second letter to Corinth, chapter 11, verse 13 to 15, where Paul said this, Such men are false apostles, and I would add women today, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Morris goes on, quote, False teachers disguise themselves as servants of God. They've learned to mimic the, the talk, the walk, the Twitter talk, in the public persona of the elect, of the elect. They must, or how could they gain a following? And sometimes these false teachers can be well-meaning, it seems. It seems not even trying to deceive anyone. Yet, however well-meaning they are, they are still false teachers and false prophets. Friends, time is not on our side to go into depth of the spider web of deceit and lies that entangle so many in the church of Jesus Christ today because the lies of false teachers has poisoned their faith. And the fallout is tremendous and it speaks volumes to the danger and harm that false teachers bring to the church. Spiritual abuse, terrible spiritual abuse, deconstruction of a person's faith, broken relationships, family and church, and etc. And there's so much more. We could just make a long, long list. And to top all this off, the name of Jesus Christ is dragged through the mud in our culture. And God the Holy Spirit is blasphemed and made out to be some crazy, wacky thing. And etc. and etc. and etc. The question is, what are we to do? Well, I want to leave you with three things that these aren't my original thoughts. These are a, uh, a combining of uh, stuff I read over the last week, articles and, and commentaries. So I give them all the credit. But I leave you with these three things so you can start with something. One, Jesus tells us to examine the lives of those who teach us. He tells us to examine the lives of those who teach us. Did you hear that? 
He said that you will recognize a false prophet by their fruits, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 20. You see, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, Jesus said. A diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. And in our time today, this is not an easy test. It takes a little bit of work, a lot of work actually. False teachers can easily disguise themselves, for example, on social media or on websites or on other platforms. However, eventually, they cannot hide their true selves forever. And it's important that we put our trust in our church leaders, not on the internet, but close to us. Two, Paul reminds us in our text that anyone who preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Paul there imploring the Galatians to examine what the teachers are saying. And what standard does the believer examine, and, what stat, and by what standard, pardon me, does the believer use to examine someone's teaching? Well, the answer is by the apostles' teachings as recorded in the Bible. Not the new apostles today, the apostles that are in the Bible. You go to Acts chapter 17. We there find a group of people called the Bereans. And it tells us there in verse 11 that they received the word with all eagerness. Yet, yet, they examined the scriptures daily to see if the things were so, were true. And three, be ready. Be ready. No matter where you are, no matter what local church you go to, false teachers will rise up among you at some point. The Apostle Peter is clear about this in his second letter, chapter 2, verse 1. I'll let you read that for yourself. You, we can be led astray by eloquent and inspirational words of pleasant and kind speakers. You need to know the real thing. You need to know it really well. You need to know your word, the Bible, really well. You need to study it. You need to study it. Can I say that again? You need to study it. So when the false shows up, you will recognize it. Can we trust our teachers? Of course. But never, ever, ever take it for granted. We always need to be serious and careful about those we trust and follow. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you. Oh Lord, we, we wonder sometimes, in our times even, we look around and, 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 and it can be somewhat scary. But Lord, we trust you, we trust uh, your word, we trust your Holy Spirit, and we trust those faithful teachers that you have in our lives to lead us and feed us and guide us. But ultimately, we trust you, Lord, and only you, and only your true gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for each one in hearing of this, that they would surrender their lives to you, repent of their sins and turn away from their way of life and turn to you and receive Christ, receive the Holy Spirit and learn the Word and know the Word and know their Bibles really well so that they'd be ready to recognize the false when it shows up. I thank you, Lord, that in the middle of all these things that you will keep your people. You will keep a remnant of your people. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for, again, inviting me into your places and spaces. I just uh, uh, pray for you and hope that you'll have a blessed day. And just uh, take care. Shalom.